All right, everyone. Welcome to uh, week four of Grasshopper, and uh, this is the third video of the week. Uh, before we begin, uh, you know, take a look at the course module, and uh, be sure to kind of go through these two files. Um, there's both the, the JPEG version and also the Grasshopper file version for you to download because these are really simple definitions. Um, just kind of play around with the variables, change them to kind of understand what's going on. Uh, this is sort of the building blocks of data management in Grasshopper. Uh, calling, weaving, being able to kind of select specific items in a, in a data list. Uh, and uh, list management here. Uh, reversing them, uh, retrieving a specific item, inserting items. Uh, shifting lists, which is very important. Um, you use that a lot, splitting lists and uh, sublists. Okay, so be sure to download both of these files, mess around with it, just kind of get a sense for what's happening. This is, uh, while it sort of might seem sort of boring at first, uh, some of these are, you know, this is like the basic alphabet. You've got to learn the alphabet before you start to uh, string together some of the words. Okay, so take a look at those. Uh, in this video, we're actually going to start to recreate this example, the pleats please example. Um, and uh, this is a competition uh, entry for a textile factory that I, uh, uh, my one of my old firms, uh, President Scott Cohen Inc., uh, had submitted um, and won, but the event, the building actually never got built in the end. But uh, the reason I call it uh, pleats please. Um, is because uh, this is very similar. The sort of pleading idea uh, comes from uh, Isamiyaki's, you know, pleats, please line of clothing, where there's this sort of nice uh, pleated subtexture uh, to all the pieces is, uh, in that line. So uh, actually, this was for Sanya, uh, a uh, Chinese textile factory. Okay, so if we take a look at this. Um, these files are here as well, but I'll sort of work through the uh, file and uh, kind of explain it as we go. But these are the two base images that we're uh, looking at for now. Uh, the file is also provided, a Rhino file, which is this one, uh, please, please, dot, dot, 3 dm And uh, you'll see I have some initial geometry in there uh, for you to kind of start out with. Okay. Now, uh, when faced with a problem like this, or when you're kind of looking at trying to analyze something like this, um, it always helps to start out by not by jumping straight into Grasshopper, but actually just sketching out the problem, you know, by hand um, on a piece of paper, and to kind of try to figure um, that out. And you'll see that this has like two sides to it. Um, this side, uh, which is, it seems like the panels are uh, sort of doubly curved a little bit and there's a side which is offset outwards and there's a side which is uh, more or less like a seam, like they're joining together. This side seems like it's pretty simple, it's a sort of zigzag, right? These are essentially zigzag panels. And so we'll kind of look at these um, separately. Now to kind of make it easier at first, I'm going to look at the right side. Uh, which in the example is actually this horizontal version, uh, please, please horizontal. Okay, so the right side, if you look at it, it's actually just a simple zigzag going in and out and in and out, right? And um, I'm going to switch over here. And to kind of illustrate that, Okay, so what you're gonna see uh, in your viewport might actually get, it might actually get uh, reversed. Um, so bear with me. Uh, you have the idea that you're trying to get a panel that basically looks like that, right? That's the sort of simple version of it. And if you have a lot of them in a line like this then you're basically trying to get it to zigzag 
like that. So this is this is this would be uh, more or less in plan, right? And then all the other stuff comes from these subdivisions and that and that and that. Okay. So the basic logic behind this is actually quite simple. You have a line segment, and you subdivide the line segments into however many subdivisions, right? And that's the sort of basic uh, starting point for a lot of this. Um, to kind of get these points, at least in plan, what you can do very easily is take that curve and offset it a certain distance, right? So you get another curve there. And you can either do the, the same uh, subdivision, or as you see in the grasshopper logic, we use a uh, component that finds the sort of closest points on uh, a neighboring curve, right? And then from there, uh, you can kind of actually just get it to reconnect these lines, right? After reconnecting these lines, uh, then you, you get a set of zigzags, right? So you just need to duplicate it again on the top and then loft these from one to the other to get these panels. Now, this is just only kind of one way of doing it. There's, you know, tons of other ways of doing this, uh, versions or even ones where you kind of skip between, you know, to kind of get this more a more aggressive slant, uh, you know, but this is the version we're going to use, uh, work with uh, for now. All right, I'm gonna pause that. Okay, so uh, to start out, if we kind of look at this side, the right side, I've already kind of labeled one of these a pleat curve and one of these a seam curve. So the seam is like where they join together, blah, blah. But on the right side, it really doesn't matter because if you look at um, the image, they're basically zigzagging, right? So really quickly, uh, we will just uh, drop in a uh, curve component, params, geometry, curve, container, okay? Uh, duplicate it. So one is going to be the top, set one curve, and one is going to be the bottom, set one curve. Okay? Simple enough. And uh, we are going to, you can just try and see which one you want to do first, but you're, you're going to divide it, divide curve right here. So this asks me for a curve to divide, number of segments and whether or not we are going to split the segment that kinks. Uh, we're ignoring that for now. Let's do this. And by default you'll see there's a 10 in the number of segments, so we'll just use that as a sort of guideline for now, because uh, you can kind of see what's happening. All right? Now we know that we also want to offset this curve, right? So let's offset. Offset curve is specified distance, and let's see what happens. Okay, so it's going in the right direction. Remember, all Rhino curves have direction. If I change the direction, it's going from left to right right now. If I change the direction of the Rhino curve, you'll see that the offset goes in the opposite direction. Like the offset goes inwards. Okay, so. If your offset isn't going in the right direction, then just flip the direction of your curves, right? Because the uh, plane for the offset operation is the world x, y, right? So it's going to be offset uh, horizontally on the world x, y plane. Okay. Now this distance, offset distance, we can set, and um, I'm going to make a slider to um, 4.0. So between 0 to 4. And you'll see that basically changes it, so the offset distance is much greater than we had before. Okay. 
So I'm going to start, uh, let's just start with that. And um, I'm actually going to do a slightly different version here uh, than the uh, posted example, but the principle is the same. So I'm actually just going to take this guy and divide it again. Okay? So you have the original curve that's been divided, you have the offset curve that's been divided, you know, the same number. Actually, let's just set that right now, 0 to, let's say, up to 40. This is an integer slider. You can keep it at 10 for now, but push that into the number of subdivisions, and they can all use the same one. All right? And you'll see that, you know, this basically happens in parallel, right? Okay. So what happens when we just use a line component and connect the dots like that? So we get lines drawn in between, you know, the divided points, right? And you know, more or less whatever this sort of all works. Okay. So if you uh, refer back to the sketch. Now we want the ones that are actually crossing this way, right? The diagonals in this sort of sketch. So now what we're looking for is a way to connect this point to this point, right? And go across. Okay? All right. So as uh, you were kind of looking earlier um, on the website, you know, the component that we're using here is the shift component, right? The shift list. So let's try that. Shift list. Okay. So I guess we want to, if we're using the inner sort of back curve as the baseline, um, we're going to want to shift the one that's on the outside, right? The, the curve that's been offset. Okay. So we're going to take these points, the ones that are on the outside, and push them into the shift component. And uh, just to kind of visualize it, uh, let's get a slider that goes from 0 to 3. Oops. Okay. And give it a shift of 1. So we have, uh, here we have, what, 15 locally defined values. We have 15 here. Okay. And uh, you can highlight this and see if anything changes. Not really. Now remember to check this wrapped values uh, and you'll see why in a little bit. But basically this is one of the lines. Let's just copy paste that. And we know that these are the back points that we want. These should be the front points that we want. So push that in. Okay. So we'll just highlight it. Now you see that, okay, we have diagonals, but then there's one big crossing diagonal going from the beginning to the end of the curve, right? And this is because of the wrapped values uh, you know, sort of setting. So we need a Boolean toggle. And this is false, right? So if it becomes false, you see that diagonal automatically disappears, right? And then if we change the shift to zero, then it's corresponding one to one, change it to two uh, to one, then it goes one diagonal, two goes two diagonals, three goes three diagonals. All right? And that's how basically this shifting uh, affects this curve. All right? So very simply, these two are your sort of desired line outputs, right? On the ground, it's this zigzag. Okay, so that's simple enough. Uh, now the top and bottom are identical, right? So uh, all you really need to do in this case, and you can actually just like reuse these exact same uh, counters unless you want to kind of mess around uh, with the different offset distances, because uh, these should be the same. Uh, this definitely wants to be the same, right? Because we're going to loft in between these eventually. Okay, so we can just like take this, 
copy it, paste. All right. And uh, let's say this is the curve, that's the curve, and there you have it. So these are the variables. Top, bottom are the same now. All right. Okay. What's the next step? Lofting in between them, right? Okay. Let's look at the loft component. Loft component generally is uh, smart enough to kind of try to figure out what you're asking it to do. Um, however, there are times when um, you actually might need to kind of try to figure out or arrange data correctly because there's a chance, let's say, if you give it this input, the loft curve might actually try to loft between your curves, right? Rather than, let's say, going from here to here. So we're wanting to uh, loft uh, these guys to these guys, right? And that's the set, and these diagonals to these diagonals, just to kind of uh, mentally separate these so you get a better sense. So you'll see that um, when I actually just use this and pull that into the loft component, it does exactly that. It lofts in between these curves uh, in sequence, so you get a flat plane and that's really not what you want. Even if I try to do this and uh, add the second set of these sort of short uh, curves in, you'll see that this is what it does. It actually starts with that curve, lofts, and then starts to with another list and then does that. Okay, And this is because, uh, remember that this is one long list and starts with the first one and goes to the next one. It assumes that you're trying to loft it this way and then loft it to the next set of curves that are coming from here. And that's exactly what we don't want, right? We want to actually get it to loft between each of them individually. So that's why at this point you need what's called the uh, graft component, right? The graft component essentially takes in, uh, let's take this takes this list and does that to it, right? It splits this like long list of 15 and puts them each into their individual cubicle, right? And so when you give a loft component this kind of data structure, then it actually knows well enough to say, okay, these are all individual ones, right? So if I actually push that in, nothing happens because there's nothing for this one to loft to. And so we give it another set that's from here, and then it will know that you're actually trying to match between the cubicles in this graph and the cubicles in this graph. So let's just do that really quickly. So this gives the same result, right? Okay, and so now if you put just put this in um, by holding down the shift key, you'll see that now the graph component understands that you're trying to allow this line to this line, this line to this line, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and they should correspond across that way. Okay, all right. So that's those, and then obviously we need another one that does these diagonals. Right, symbol, same thing. Also need to graph it because they have the same data structure. And also need a loft component. So you'll see this um, does the same thing. All right, so in the end, um, in the end, these two are the geometry that you want. Okay? And that's what that looks like. Very simple. And obviously you can kind of change the offset distance if they change together, uh, change how 
corrugated it is. Um, if you split the uh, offset distance you know, between the top and the bottom, then you basically kind of get this a leaning effect, right? Because the top or the bottom, it depends on what you're trying to mess up, mess around with. Uh, so the top would kind of lean in. All right. So, yeah, I'm going to annotate this really quickly uh, and then come back. All right, so that kind of gives you a general idea of the overall structure. Um, I'm going to uh, disable preview for these, uh, just so you have only the surfaces left, right? Which is these. Okay, um, and then obviously you can do the same thing to that and that. Uh, just sort of copy it again. Um, you just copy the whole thing and do another set for the bottom, right? Or you can just bake things, right? So this is the right side or the um, pleats please horizontal, which is the easy version. Let's go to the left side and uh, look at uh, the harder version. So the harder version here, if you kind of look, the bottom of the seam uh, this is more or less uniform. The top, it just sort of kinks out on one side and does a zigzag on the top. Okay, So if we look at this uh, in terms of its structure, and I'm going to come back to here. What we're looking at is actually going to be something similar to this. So you have for each individual panel, you'll have more or less a rectangular sort of tall frame and dotted line, dotted line, dotted line. Okay. Now the bottom part of it, the seams, um, those were actually consistent, right? So the seams were actually on the same line sort of um, in the back here. Alright, and then um, if we look at this, the way it kind of kinks out uh, in one corner, but then goes back, zigzags back, right? So it's kinking out in this corner, and then zigzagging back to there. And then this goes, connects down, and is one of like these sort of shorter triangular side panels. Whereas this line just goes down. So three dimensionally, you know, that's uh, roughly. I and mean, actually, this might be easy to understand if I flip it around in this direction. Is that's what you're looking for? Now, if you imagine this basically in a similar framework, then it's the same thing uh, for especially for the top. This part, right? This part we've done before already with the shift component. So. It's just a matter of actually finding this and lofting in between them. Uh, same thing, take two lines, right? one offset, subdivide, and this, right? So this sort of square footprint essentially fits into one of these. All right, and so you'd get that. So that's the broad idea. Uh, the only difference to the previous example is, you know, you only have one seam sort of curve uh, on the bottom side. All right, so let's uh, see how that works out. Okay. Uh, so we know that part of it is actually very similar. Uh, so why don't we just uh, copy some of this stuff? Let's just uh, take that at least. Control C, Control V, move it down. Um, and this.
So the number of subdivisions will keep the same. This top curve will relink to this one. And then uh, let's do the top first, right? Okay. So the top, if we can see it, okay. Uh, you might have to re-enable these so you can actually see these. Okay. So you'll see this. We already have this. Uh, in the example that I give you guys, though, uh, instead of dividing uh, this like outer curve, uh, the curve that's offset. Let's change this to three. Uh, I use a component called curve CV CP, and let me delete the curve closest point. So the way curve CP works is um, it has an input points and curve to project onto, and it basically finds, let's say in this case. Uh, the points are these guys, the ones that are from the original subdivision, and the curve is the offset curve. And so you could do that. It basically finds the closest sort of possible point on that line that's closest to these points and marks it. Right? So if you draw a line between this and this, that usually is, or I think it should be, always a perpendicular, 90 degrees, right? If you draw that line segment. Okay? This, uh, you know, operationally, it's no different from just like dividing it. Um, but this component, the curve CP component, you will find will actually come in handy um, in future, in the future, right? It's a pretty handy component to learn, know and learn. All right. Same thing. Uh, we'll start to draw the lines. And it's going to go between this. Uh, to here, right? So these points, the uh, same thing. So you go A um, to B. So you get these lines. All right. Now again, we want to get the diagonals, right? So the shift component, this is from above and doesn't change. So you pull that in and you swap out the bottom one to get the diagonals. Right? And the same thing if you kind of change this, you get more or less. Okay? Now you can just like right click, you know, set integer and type in one, right? But this just kind of makes it more explicit and you know, okay, you're putting in one as the shift. Okay? So the top uh, you have, we have already. Alright? And these are the sort of two. Uh, lines that are associated with it. Uh, and let's like put it here for now. Okay. Uh, the seam curve is basically the same thing. And so let's actually just take this and the divide. Control C, Control V. All right. And this time this is the, well, we can just call it the seam curve and rename this uh, pleat curve. Alright, relink this, set one curve to seam curve V1, which is this one. It doesn't really matter, but you know it's the inner one. Okay. And the divisions are the same, but you want your divisions to always be the same number. Um, your offset distance is here. And let's see. All right. So now we have a lot of points. Uh, you can do this two ways. You can kind of actually use these points to shatter the original curve. However, there is a problem because of the way we're doing the subdivision. Uh, let's say the kink here, right, where it turns, your panel will actually kind of draw and just like go straight across that corner. Um, so if you do the shatter, you'll get a strange sort of loft situation where you know, one of your lines is actually a corner uh, instead of a straight line. So I'll do a different version here where I basically use the polyline and the vertices to redraw the polyline. So you'll see what I mean, like in this case, the polyline just spans across. All right. Now these are polylines 
which uh, because they're drawn from all these different points, it's easy to explode the curve into smaller segments. All right? So now the exploded curve is now uh, 15 individual curves. And you can check that. Right? 0 to 14, the total of 15 uh, short segments curves, which is what we want for the bottom. Okay? That's sort of simple enough. We need a loft component, right? So we're trying to loft from these sort of bottom short segments to the top diagonal segments, right? So let's find the diagonal ones, which are these, okay? So these guys, we want to loft. Now remember what happened before, okay? The data structure. This is, you know, a long list of lines. And if you try to loft it like that, it doesn't know what you want to do. Um, so, same thing. Let's graft it. If you graft it, then you'll see that, okay, now they're all in their individual silos, right? Okay. As a single, it still doesn't know what you know, you're still, you're still not getting any sort of noticeable result, okay? Now, the data from here, these, same thing, right? It's a series line like curves. Um, so we need the graph component again to get it into individual silos. And let's add this into the loft. And voila, that's what you'll get. These are slightly doubly curved surfaces, right? Um, because they're not plated. And then that's one half. Okay? So you can put these, you know, or align these whatever way to kind of help you organize or understand um, the definition a little better. All right. On the top here, these are the short spanning curves, and they're being lofted or put essentially to a point. Now you could use like, you know, the three points or a surface and just like duh, 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 right, uh, or put input these three uh, coordinates if you can. But there's a very uh, convenient component uh, under surface uh, freeform and extrude point, right? Extrude curves and surfaces to a point, which is exactly the situation we have here. So. Let's do that. Input, one of them is a profile curve or surface, the other is extrusion tip, which is a point, right? So the points are these guys, and let's go quick, go back. Okay, these are the exploded segments. These are the polyline. So it's actually coming from here, right? We have to kind of um, actually backtrack to these division points, okay? Um, now you could uh, for these points you could put in this which are the vertices of the exploded uh, sort of uh, short segments but it's actually a good idea to kind of check what kind of data structure it is as well right so these are one long list and this is one long list as well, right? So essentially these two are, would be more or less the same thing or identical. Um, there wouldn't be much difference. For the profile curves, obviously you want to put in these sort of short segments, right? So it's this, this line, uh, these short segments. So let's pull that in first. And obviously in this case, um, because they only have one target, the extrude to point uh, curve actually understands um, what you're trying to do, and you don't have to do the graph thing. And just to kind of check, actually you can do that, you can do this, right? you can pull it from the original division points, or you can pull it from what's been exploded. Uh, the outcome is the same, it doesn't change it. Okay, so there's that.
And those are your two sort of main, oops, sort of two main outputs, right? This is the vertical version, and that's the horizontal version, right? And there's just like slight vari variation of each other, right? Now obviously, there's stuff happening in this sort of intersection, um, and you can try to relink, let's say, relink it to this bottom to try and fix it. Right, and you eventually just remove this fin, um, and you kind of get actually the whole uh, sort of facade working. All right, and then to, to do the bottom part, uh, it's just almost a simple matter as just sort of taking this whole thing, uh, making another copy, and then linking in the seam curve in reverse, so set one curve, this is the seam curve, and uh, whoops, this one becomes the pleat curve, right, in reverse. Yeah. Now it's probably a good idea to keep your subdivision, you know, the same um, in those cases, but you can kind of change the offset distance. Same thing for that side, uh, you just duplicate it. Alright, now while this might seem like a very big messy definition, eventually um, I'll show you guys an example in where you can like compact all of this into one component. But not yet. Alright, so you can bake these and it becomes uh, your geometry um, for the facade. Alright, and you can try it on this, uh, the curved version which is actually pretty nice as well. So pleat curve is the top, seam curve, set one curve is the middle, and then pleat curve becomes that one, and the seam curve becomes the middle one. All right, just kind of depending on uh, what you're trying to kind of get at. Uh, you can maybe reverse it if you want, or mess with the sort of offset distance so one is less than the other, but have a nice sort of seam curve down the middle. Okay? Alright, so um, that's more or less it for this video. Um, if you need to refer to this, you can check it out. Um, this is just kind of, this extra stuff is just kind of using the length component. Um, oops. Uses the length component and the panel to kind of measure, you know, the length of, the width of uh, each component. I mean, you can see they're actually all very close to three uh, of each line. And uh, yeah, you can measure each width. You can also uh, measure area off of these as well, right? If you want to kind of figure out what the area of some of these guys are. Uh, where is this one? here. Uh, these are the small triangular ones or the large ones. Uh, just kind of see the area or see the width, right? And um, if you're looking at the example uh, and you see this, these sort of really thin lines, uh, that's basically, you know, sometimes when you get a lot of lines flying around everywhere and you have like something that's like sort of on its own by itself, you can right click the input, go to wire display, and either make it faint or hidden. If it's faint, then it becomes this really thin line. It becomes substantiated if you select the component, then it disappears, right? So it's less of a distraction. If you change it to hidden, it becomes a sort of wireless radio display, no lines, but the line will pop up when you uh, select it, okay? So that's just like something to know uh, in terms of the interface, that's how it will show things. 
uh, you can do the same with this kind type of line as well. All right, it'll only pop up when you have the uh, component selected, so you don't have crossing lines, you know, flying everywhere um, in a very dense uh, sort of uh, definition. Okay. All right. So that's it.